Hello, everyone. I am Peter Gilmartin, Program Consultant at Primary Source in Watertown, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Primary Source webinar on Indian Ocean Interactions in World History. <laughs> Primary Source is a 28-year-old nonprofit organization that works to advance global education in schools. We believe in the power of understanding the world from diverse perspectives and in a future in which all people are informed and contributing global citizens. This session takes us to the Indian Ocean Basin, which has been a zone for human interactions throughout history and presents an approach to world history which goes beyond the confines of land-based civilizations. Our presenting scholar is Dr. Susan Douglas, who is the Education Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. It's my pleasure to welcome Susan and to thank her for taking the time to present for us to us this evening. After her presentation, there will be time for questions. During your presentation, if you have questions or comments, feel free to post them in the chat box. Now, without further ado, let me turn the controls over to Susan. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? I want to thank, first of all, Peter and Stephanie uh, and everyone at Primary Source for hosting this webinar. And thanks to all the participants who are joining us this evening. I want to start with, um, with a simple question of how and why we study the Indian Ocean. There are, of course, many reasons, but a few of them make it a really fascinating topic. The first is that it was the first ocean traversed by human beings who migrated along its shore in the exit from Africa all the way to Australia. So the actual human migration that populated the planet uh, actually began along the shores of the Indian Ocean at the, um, the gates of grief in what is now Yemen and the Red Sea. Also, an interesting aspect of why we get so many tropical um, exotic plants is that the Ice Age didn't kill off plants and animals. Uh, it didn't occur in, in that degree in the Indian Ocean. And so a, a huge variety of species evolved in this tropical zone. Another reason is that its trade routes, and many times the very same trade routes, extend from ancient to modern times. So it's kind of a laboratory for, uh, for the very earliest beginnings of, of globalization, what we call globalization today. And then finally, the Indian Ocean and its shores uh, mirror the history of human development and civilization. Another reason to study the Indian Ocean, particularly in the frame that I'm going to uh, introduce it today, and Peter already mentioned that, is that uh, it expands the way we teach world history and the whole concept of world history and takes us toward uh, a sort of new, newer paradigm for teaching about the world uh, in, a, in a more globalized way. Uh, so history, of course, used to be the history of one civilization after another, or so as some people put it, one darn thing after another. Uh, unfortunately, in looking at what a civilization was, um, many rather culturally imperialistic uh, considerations got into that. And geographically speaking, huge regions were missing from these courses, um, even just land-based, but certainly the seas were not, uh, were not something that was mentioned, especially not until the European Age of Exploration at any rate. So global world history uh, includes complex societies, lands and seas between them, and, and the structure of these courses is actually eras. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch to get to be able to teach that way, as we have most of our textbooks for regular kids, as opposed to um, advanced placement books that, that use the civilizations as the building block. So teaching the oceans gives a global view. And uh, many standards and textbooks don't reflect the new global structure of eras, but many do request um, or, or have as part of their standards um, teaching about global interactions, teaching about interactions among cultures. And, um, and they mention the Indian Ocean, but there's very little material in the books for doing that. 
So I'm going to introduce tonight um, a lot of the of the sort of way that I'm going to speak about this and examples that don't that that aren't confined to what I'm going to do, but uh, will be sort of a jumping off point. Uh, and that is a website called the Indian Ocean in World History, uh, IndianOceanHistory.org. As you see it there on the bottom of the screen, is a teaching tool that was uh, sponsored and is sponsored by the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center. Uh, a teaching tool for putting the new global structure for world history into practice. In other words, a website like this and several others, um, like World History for Us All, uh, give you a kind of a pathway and a bridge toward toward the new world history and working around around uh, eras across the globe as the structure for for teaching a survey of the world. This is the brand new, I don't know if any of you who are on the webinar have used the site before, but this is the uh, brand new, uh, newly, uh, it took about two or three years, uh, redesigned and reprogrammed from A to Z, um, Indian Ocean World History website. It has all the features of the old one and also some new features that I'm going to be introducing tonight. Um, just to give you a quick aside, the reason why it was reprogrammed was because it was in Adobe Flash before. The whole thing was programmed in Adobe Flash. And um, we know that's not going to be a, a lasting platform probably. So it's now uh, programmed in HTML. And um, they, they've been working on this for a number of years. But we've added some very interesting new features. So I'm going to walk you through. Um, several of the features you can see here on the screen. Uh, one of the more fun things is this sort of banner that runs across that gives you preview of some of the images and the characterization of each era. Uh, we still have the introductory materials uh, that show you how to use the website. Uh, the heart of the site is the central area, the maps, and you can get to those from a number of, uh, of different places in the site. You have then learning tools, and those are listed in this left-hand box, a student guide on how to use the site, a teacher's guide, uh, historical overviews for each era, uh, a very extensive bibliography on the Indian Ocean, which is in itself a resource, and a number of other things, including under lesson plans, that's another, another um, set on the menu here, um, our graphic organizers I'll show you in a minute, and then an extensive sent, uh, uh, site, excuse me, list of, of credits. So moving on, I want to sort of get you through the features of the site. Um, what does it offer students? It invites exploration of the ocean across eras. So the idea here is for students to be able to track um, and investigate and make inferences about things that happened within certain eras of world history. And those will be delineated clearly on the site as well with timelines. Um, and what happened across eras? How did things change? How did they stay the same? So it's, it's primarily a kind of a way for you to step back from the list of civilizations, if that's what, uh, what you have as, as your curriculum, and be able to sort of step back and take a look at, at, at the broader uh, set of interactions in, in, that, in each period. The way that it does this is uh, through examination of six different types of primary sources and plus roots. And those six types are documents, geography, as, a, as in geographic features, goods, objects, travelers, technologies, and, um, and again, and, and roots, as I mentioned. So part of the idea here, which makes it a very high value way of exploring and makes the Indian Ocean a high value topic, is that it encourages skill development because um, it, it has some scaffolding lessons, uh, sub-lessons within it uh, that help students to ask questions about primary sources. And I'll show you those shortly. Um, it also investigates in the, in the course of doing that a lot about how we know what we know in these things. So the primary sources are there, but we have some investigations of, and evidence on, on how we've discovered these things. So also, I think one of the things that made it so enjoyable to work on for years and years is there are some incredibly fun stories out there. And I'll be investigating those with you, a couple of samples of those with you tonight. So the basis of the whole site is um, what you get from it is uh, on the maps, which I'll show you shortly, 
uh, you will be able to hover on the different uh, pictorial icons and they will be labeled. In this particular case, it's one from the first global era and it happens to be a piggy bank found is in East Java. Here's the entry which comes up when you click on that. So you can hover and get the entry title, click the icon for the entry and um, you will have this open up right on the screen on top of the map. You can actually drag it and move it away so you can see where it was. So in other words, these primary sources are actually found in the location that is relevant to the primary sources, in the geographic location. So that's often very important information as well. The new feature here is, that's not showing on here, but it will in a minute, is that you can now, which you could not do before, you can now save these um, entries to a lesson plan. Sort of like bookmarking them, they actually actually get moved to a lesson plan that you can then personalize. Uh, once you get those entries, you can um, view them and edit them, and you can also print them. So that means that if you need to um, work on the language or insert you know, vocabulary for your particular students, you can do that. So here's what I mentioned earlier. The skills lessons are under the map key which rides with every single map. It's exactly the same. And anytime you click on any of these icons, you will be able to bring up a skills lesson which looks like this. These are all screenshots so I can't scroll you through it. But what they essentially contain is a set of leading questions. And these questions came from uh, the Center, Histri Center for History and New Media at George Mason University's um, very rich resource called World History Sources. And there you will find uh, a number of lessons that, that go into great depth on how to analyze a particular primary source. So I have very much simplified those um, into, into several important questions. And I should also mention as I move on um, that we have, uh, excuse me, I, that'll be a little bit later, but we have created um, a set of note-taking grids that correspond to these questions for each one of these types of primary source. And you'll see that uh, those graphic organizers in a bit. So what the site contains is about 500 different entries on the, uh, on the several different era maps. And you can also search them. So here's an example of um, search for the word banana and bananas occur uh, which they are today a global cash crop of, of significant importance uh, happen to be an environmentally endangered one but nonetheless and they go all the way back to the ancient era so you can trace their origins their spread their uses uh, nutritionally and otherwise uh, their mentions by travelers and so on and so forth and again each one is linked to a certain location um, it's really a good idea to use the search engine because you might be surprised as you investigate the site at the various um, uh, things that do happen across areas. That's one of the main purposes for the site. So spices would be another one, but also cotton and, and so many others. We'll investigate a few of those during this webinar. Here are the graphic organizers that I mentioned. And um, you will see that they are, once you get them, you, once you download them, you will see that these uh, graphic organizers are in Microsoft Word, which means they're not PDFs and you don't have to write in teeny tiny, you know, script. Once you start writing in one of the boxes, uh, it will expand as, as, as Microsoft Word does. So these are yours to have. They're also editable and, and you use them as you see fit. Those, by the way, are under lesson plans. I, they would have been under learning tools, but they happen to have landed under, um, under lesson plans. Here is the lesson plan generator. And it does a couple of things. Um, first of all, you have to log in. So you have to create yourself a login and a password uh, for that. And once you've done so, I would suggest doing that as soon as you get on the site because you can't begin to bookmark um, things until you have done so. Uh, but the, the lesson plan generator has two components. One of them is the ability to actually bookmark and save and view um, a list of entries that you as a teacher or that the students have, have picked out. They can actually generate their own login if they want to or if you want them to. The second aspect of the lesson plan generator is um, that in, you can actually create a lesson plan with its own title, with an overview, you know, what age group this is for. Um, learning goals and outcomes for your, that match to your standards and your objectives and so on, what materials you need if you're doing something beyond the site, you know, like having samples of cloth or spices or who knows what, and the time and so on, and then you'll be able to lay out procedures. 
Um, once you have done the lesson plan and identified all of the uh, entries that you want to use, you can actually um, create the lesson plan, um, you know, and it'll come up in as a Word document on your computer. So that's kind of a nice feature. Um, you can make use of once you get it into into Word, uh, you can then add to these boxes and so on. So you're not limited to doing it online. You can you can edit it and change it as you get done. Um, this is what the bookmarked entries look like. And so it will show you the a thumbnail sketch of, of an image from it. It will show you the era it belongs to. That's very important because otherwise it might be rather confusing. It allows you to, to compare things better. Um, and then it has a title as well. And you'll be able to view that or or you'll be able to to edit to edit them, you know, once you once you get um, once you get them going. So here again is the URL of the site, and here are the dates for the map. The seven world era, as you know who work with, as those of you who work with eras as a framework for the course know that there's a lot of overlap, but these are, are based on kind of the general consensus for what, um, for what historians have identified as the various eras that um, that makes sense, um, particularly here the divisions between the classical and, and the medieval period around 300 CE. Um, it's not an accident that they correspond roughly also to, um, to world history for us all, uh, which is the work of numerous historians. And so, so this kind of works. But again, in your own course, it might be 1500. It might be you know, some other time period. That doesn't prevent you from, from using the site. But there, you'll find them, I think, to be pretty generally um, pretty generally useful. So again, what you have in looking at these different eras is the, the, the big question that goes for any historian and any time you're trying to use eras is, OK, so then what happened in this era? And you will be able to download historical overviews for each era. And um, these will highlight ways of exploring the Indian Ocean time, um, making and testing inferences and evidence. Now, um, there are a couple of ways you can use these. And one of them is that you could, of course, download and, and print out for the students. They are each one about a page, page and a half or so. You could actually um, put the, um, print them out and have the students read, you know, before you study a certain era, uh, what happened in it. Another way to do it that I think makes, makes perhaps more sense and is more interesting is to have students investigate the different types of primary sources. Say one group investigates the you know, trade goods, another one investigates objects, another one travelers, and so on. And then make some conclusions about what was going on during that era, during that period of time. Uh, and then once you've done that, uh, they, can test, uh, they can test their inferences by reading the historical overview. And of course, it's not the be all and end all, and they may come up with some other ideas. But um, but it's one way of doing it, or going into the um, in or or telling them, okay, here's the here's the uh, error overview at the at the beginning, and then now go into the website and look for evidence of, of those things. So these are two different ways to to go at it. So what I want to do now is ask you to um, bring up your um, primary sources because I'm going to actually go through the um, the actual entries that sort of illustrate uh, how this how the site works. So what you see in the maps, and as I said, you can get to the maps on the website from either the home page or uh, at any point from any other map, you can click on these tabs and you'll be able to, um, to bring up the, the map for that era. So this one is the prehistoric era. And as you can see, here's the map key with the skills entries. And what I have brought up is, um, is one on technology. So there's two here that I've brought up. One of them is genographic typing of human DNA. And the other one that goes with this is the Mimi figures. And that is way down here. I've actually covered it up with the screenshot. It's down in Australia, right at the northern tip of Australia, where it almost joins to the Indian uh, archipelago. So um, the genographic typing of human DNA is over here. And it refers, of course, to um, the exploration of, of early human migration and 
even infecting to our own times, but especially early human migration and in terms of how did um, how did human beings come out of Africa and populate the world. So this is of course only a fragment of it and it emphasizes the part that is affecting the Indian Ocean. So you have here a pretty short explanation of genographic typing of human DNA. And um, and finally, as you can see along, if I, I hope you can see my cursor, but in any case, if I were to trace from Africa, from Yemen, across the Indian Ocean, all the way around India, all the way across um, the Bay of Bengal and down into Southeast Asia, across Indonesia and into Australia, that is where you would find um, the Mimi paintings, which are from the Bradshaw paintings of the uh, prehistoric era. And these refer to um, the wonderful and imaginative rock art that uh, reflects about 500, uh, excuse me, 50,000 before present when the Australian Aborigines were already there and, and living their lives and, and making really incredibly impressive uh, rock art that's uh, actually featured in the, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So you'll be able to look at those um, at those at those paintings, and it refers, of course, to the fact that that um, between 40 and 60 thousand years before present, um, people had already made this this long journey across the rim of, northern rim of the Indian Ocean. So moving on to um, to the next map, which is the ancient era, I'm going to skip forward for a second. The three entries that I picked out for this one are um, the Austronesians, the earliest boats, and the port of Lothal. So I'm going back now to the map. And here you will find that um, the one on the earliest boats is here. Whether those are absolutely the earliest boats in human history, we don't know. But we do know about the ones that are there because they're pictured in various um, various documents and, and carvings and so on and so forth. The Austronesians is over here on the far end of the map by what is Taiwan. Uh, and that is the entry point or the, uh, the, the supposed uh, known origin of the Austronesians. And you will find, if you look on the handout, you'll find a map that shows the extent of migration of the Austronesian people, which is from the Pacific Ocean and of course out into the Pacific where they settled the, the, the islands in the Pacific Ocean, but also also reaching all the way through um, the Indian Ocean to what is today's Madagascar. So this is a people who had populated the widest breadth of longitude of, of any people before modern times. The um, the technology entry that I featured here on the earliest boats, wooden, reed, and papyrus, um, is simply an example for um, a fact that I wanted to highlight on this website. It, it basically contains the history of shipping from these early rafts and papyrus boats all the way to modern container ships and liquid natural gas, cargo ships, aircraft carriers, and so forth. So if you were to um, to search ships and boats, you know, you'd be able to find a, a whole raft of entries um, of, of boats from many different groups of people, including including from Southeast Asia. Um, the port of Lothal is is on the B Gulf of Cambay. It's over here in the place. You see, little arch is, is a place name, and it refers to um, a port that was used to trade in Harappan times between um, between Mesopotamia and Harappan society. So I want to move on because I need to to kind of get through all of these. So I'm moving quite quickly, but of course this is just inviting you to to investigate. For the classical era, as you can see also that the roots are changing as you get to um, as you get into the classical era from 1000 BCE, at least by then and possibly before, people had learned how to cross in open water. And if you go back to the classical era, you see that the roots go mostly around the coastlines. And, and so here is a, a real um, change in the technology of navigation that allowed people to move across into open water using astronomy and, and, and very simple forms of, of knowing your own latitude. So 
Um, another interesting factor there is that the classical era already marks the period when the secret of the monsoon winds was known. In other words, the winds that would carry you across the, the, the portion of the Indian Ocean, which is known as the Arabian Sea, between East Africa and um, the eastern coast, uh, the western coast of, of India. So that's another really important important watershed. So the um, the entries that I brought here were simply Roman coins in India and sugar cane in Southeast Asia. So Roman coins were found on the eastern coast of India in a pot. Uh, this is only one instance. There actually have been many found. But uh, it's very interesting because while people might say, oh, that means the Romans were there, um, it may not mean that any specific Roman was there, but that somehow a relay trade took place that brought these Roman coins uh, to purchase silk, pepper, or whatever it happens to have been at that time. And the entry includes also some interesting information about um, about the, the use to which um, to which coins were put, uh, including marking them. Um, you know, making defacing them so that they could carry the face of a different ruler, so they've been stamped over and things like that. The second entry that I highlighted is uh, sugar cane, and in order to uh, to find that, you would go to Papua New Guinea, which is thought to be the origin of sugar cane, which uh, was refined from uh, from a simple grass. I mean, if, um, of course, grasses contain sugar, but the sugar cane variety. Of, of grass is one of the most productive uh, plants. And what this represents for the classical era is one of numerous things that um, began in Southeast Asia in the tropical zone and that spread across, uh, um, across the Indian Ocean by one means or another and became a, an important crop grown under irrigation, for example, in India and in the Gupta period or any one of the um, of the high periods of, of irrigation technology, and which from there then spread up into across land to say Persia, and then eventually in in Islamic times uh, spread across the Mediterranean, and in many cases arrived in in Spain. And of course, the important thing, if you trace this this passage across through the eras, you'll find sugar in numerous eras on this website. And of course, Spain, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, was a jumping off point for sugar, which was then brought to um, to the New World, where it uh, joined with 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 the slave trade, uh, to be an you know extremely earth-shaking um, change in global trade. So, uh, this again is just one example. Others are tea. We mentioned already bananas, uh, the various spices, um, cotton, indigo, any number of crops of that nature. So. Here's the medieval era, and um, the screenshot that I did obscures a lot of the trade routes, I'm sorry to say. But uh, you'll find that this uh, is, has often been called in the, in the National Standards for World History is called the era of intensified human interactions. And so you can see how the intensification of routes and, and the intensification of travel on those routes um, is very pronounced. If you look at the, at, the, at the website, you'll find that these networks are becoming much, uh, much thicker and denser. So the entry that I chose to show here was um, the passage of Indian numerals um, to become what's called Arabic numerals that achieved largely by land, but they also spread uh, along the seaports where they were used by merchants eventually. And here you can see on the entry log into lesson, uh, print, and so on and so forth. So. Um, the entries that I chose for this are two of my favorites. Um, the Belitung shipwreck, which was found just about where today's uh, Strait of Malacca and the, and, uh, and, and the city of Singapore is located. It was a shipwreck found only very recently, uh, in after I think 2004 or so, um, that is a very special one. It was found in, in 17 feet of water off the uh, an island of Indonesia. And, and it contains some 60,000 objects, um, is, is a testimony to trade from directly, direct trade from China, uh, to the Middle East in enormously luxurious goods, including porcelain. The first example of blue white porcelain that's, that's ever been found, you know, pushing the dates back. So many of the things found in the ship really push the dates back, um, 
and so on. So here's the entry, and you can find how it was found and what you know what objects were found in the ship. And of course, students can now uh, go and find a whole lot of more information about the Bellytown shipwreck, um, which was purchased in whole by the um, Singaporean government, and they built a museum around all of this. Uh, and in addition, um, the Sultanate of Oman uh, sponsored a reconstruction of the actual ship, the Bellitung shipwreck, and sailed it to Singapore uh, just a few years ago, which repeats what they did with, with the Sohar, um, another voyage that was supposed to show that that Sinbad might have made it to China. Well, this one actually proves that, uh, that this trade was there. I forgot to mention, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see it says 990 CE, first reference to Chinese invention of the compass. Um, at the bottom of each map is a timeline that sort of anchors various events that took place uh, in, in the region and or um, anchoring events that took place elsewhere around the world so that students can sort of plug in the information they're seeing on this era to uh, important events that they've studied already in, in history. Uh, yes, going back here to the map, I'm sorry, um, the the entry that I chose as a second one was Ibn Battuta's um, observation about Chinese ships that he saw standing in a port on the western coast of India. And he described what they looked like and that they grew things on board and that they were enormous and he actually uh, is said to have sailed on one to go to China. So. Um, Ibn Battuta is one of a whole bunch of travelers in the medieval period that represent various religious groups, different purposes for traveling, and so there are short excerpts here, um, one of which is also the traveler, um, uh, not just by himself, but in a huge fleet, uh, was uh, the traveler Zheng He. Uh, the Chinese um, uh, admiral who, who uh, before the age, a European age of exploration, made an enormous set of voyages across the Indian Ocean to East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. So moving along quickly as my time runs out, um, we have the first global era. And here you can see, what I didn't obscure the roots, but here you can see a real change. And this is when you just even flip through the maps on the site and you can see the enormous change and yet the continuity in the routes that are, uh, that are shown uh, on each of these maps. Uh, and these are based on, on numerous maps that historians have put together uh, of various kinds and shipping, shipping, manifests, uh, shipping manifests and also um, you know, other kinds of technical maps for the modern era. So um, one of the things that is important to highlight here is, of course, this is now where the Europeans enter the Indian Ocean. Um, this, one, of the, one of the reasons this website was created was because of an exhibit that sort of started the history of the Indian Ocean by talking about um, the Portuguese arrival there and the European um, entry into the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic and so on. And so um, in the course of, of making a little, quote unquote, little handout for teachers that would go with that exhibit, um, we discussed what that might be. And I got all huffy and said, well, the rest of Indian Ocean history is what it would be. And those are sort of famous last words. But, um, but what happens here in this era in the context now of the 90,000 years from prehistory all the way to the present is that shows a really stark change that takes place. And so the goods that are represented here, the terms of trade for them change. One of the reasons here you see in the entry that's highlighted, uh, the East India companies, the Dutch and, the, and the, the English, but also the French are there and so on and so forth. So you start to see new technologies. You see new routes across the southern Indian Ocean. And, uh, and those are the ones that I highlighted here. So the first of the, of the, of the uh, entries in your handout is the Malay account of the Portuguese in Malacca which is a very interesting story that actually refers to something that we know about the origins of Carthage and how a piece of land was claimed and appeared to be very small but then became very large. So that's just kind of a little teaser. Um, the entry that I sub selected for the second one is called the Roaring Forties and it refers to, um, to this area down here. It 
refers to um, the the geographic feature, which is uh, very, very strong winds that blow across the southern Indian Ocean. And once they had rounded the Cape of Good Hope and began to discover, rather than going up the coast and, and exploring the um, the, the sort of M shape here to get to Indonesia, uh, they began to discover that as they went farther out, they would find very reliable, uh, although very strong winds that would carry them across the Indian Ocean south and then be able to pr provide a sort of shortcut uh, to go up to um, the Dutch possessions in Java or the English possessions in, in India and so on. And uh, if you didn't make the left turn at the right time, you might run into the coast of Australia, which has another feature uh, on a beach, uh, something which was found when a ship actually did literally run into the coast. So another little teaser for you there. The second last of the maps is the industrial and imperial era. And the important thing there, of course, in the roots cha root changes is that um, now in this era, the era of steam begins. And um, the era of steam begins, and so ships are no longer dependent on the winds as they had been before. Um, I want to back up a little bit because I just noticed on my very own handout that I missed um, a couple of really important things. Um, one of them is, uh, is the genes, dungarees, is the third entry that I had picked out for that one. And it is part of a whole story of blue jeans that starts with the discovery of cotton and indigo and goes on to all the way through modern times. Uh, makes a stop, of course, in the Americas. It makes another stop in the Pacific where the U.S. Navy is, is wearing you know, dungarees as their uniform during World War II. And so um, it's another one of the ways that shows that if you do um, a search and you will be able to find um, you'll be able to find entries that connect across the eras because these things are mentioned there. And in the case of, of the dungarees, there's a place called Dongari in western India that um, that was a place where apparently a very uh, firm type of cotton and twill was uh, was worn and, and the sailors used to used to pick those pants up um, and, and began their sort of journey of that type of fabric and, and go on and, and follow that through through the next era. Um, so in the Industrial Imperial Era here, I have picked out um, another entry, which is Merikani fabric as African fashion. And this Merikani refers to American cotton. And furthermore, it is some, a type of cotton that was made in New England and which was among the first goods that was traded um, by the young uh, American nation and uh, found a very good market in, um, in East Africa along with uh, another entry, which uh, I didn't put in here, but which is copal, which was a, 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 res, a sort of semi-fossilized resin that happens to be able to be melted down and used as furniture varnish. So when you put the two together, you get American cotton produced in, say, Lowell, Massachusetts, along with the New England um, furniture industry, uh, which has the need of this thing. So it's, a, it's an interesting illustration of, of trade and industrialization and so on that affects this region. Um, again, I chose the entry on denim jeans because during the Industrial Imperial Era, um, uh, a fabric first made in France called Serge Denim, which gives us the name denim, uh, was was produced also in the United States when um, when the famous um, uh, Levi uh, created the jeans that would be used in the West uh, for miners, pants, and so on and so forth. So the last entry, and I've got just about three minutes or so left um, to present and take your questions. The last of the maps is 20th century and globalization. And here the routes are taken from um, shipping, schema, you know, schematic shipping maps. Uh, we're now in the era of global positioning. We're in the era of, of, um, of some, uh, some changes in the terms of trade that include things like um, cotton that used to be, or clothing that used to be produced uh, in Europe and in, in the United States, exported you know, to the rest of the world, and it's particularly in colonial times. And now um, you have these centers of, of production of, of textiles and athletic shoes and various things um, actually being centered back in the Indian Ocean in our times. Um, I highlighted here on the screenshot 
um, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. One of our uh, finished lesson plans is actually on the evolution of, of the law of the sea uh, when, when the Portuguese who first claimed the ocean and claimed the right to, to, you know, to eliminate other ships in their path. Um, Hugo Grotius, Grotius' uh, challenge of that as a, as a Dutchman, and then finally the, um, the evolution of the law of the sea in the 20th century. So the entries that I had chosen for that are, are again, um, denim or dungarees, and movies and film animation. So you have those entries um, in front of you. And uh, I thought this is one that is particularly attractive to, to students who have seen all these animated films and who may not know that there's a thriving industry not only for you know, computer help centers and, and, and all sorts of other call centers like that, but also um, animation of, of films, um, of films is, is done there, which is you know, a, lot of, a lot of grunt work and very expensive and very detailed work. Uh, but is being is being done is being done for the big Hollywood studios and others there. Um, Navy dungarees. This is a really quick one to do because I've already introduced the subject. But um, jeans find their way into the Navy uniform, and so they find their way into the Pacific and back into the Indian Ocean, uh, being worn by um, by our naval um, members of the U.S. Navy. So. Um, Moving along here to quickly wrap up, um, that is, by the way, a pair of jeans that was found in a gold mine uh, and sold on eBay, no less. Uh, I want to just show you a couple of features that are there. Um, on the lesson plan section of the website, you have the, a model lesson template, which kind of gives you an idea of how you might uh, write up these things. And by the way, uh, we'd be very glad to hear from you if you have developed any particularly interesting lesson plans that you'd like to share. Uh, you can use that template, and we can actually publish it if you'd like. So there's a guide also called Using the Indian Ocean and World History Throughout the Year. And then there are the lesson plans that have been developed by various authors. Um, the story of blue jeans is down at the bottom. Whose Ocean Is It? The Right of Discovery versus um, Freedom of the Seas. A treasure Hunt lesson plan, which is used to introduce students to the site if they've never used it before. A collection of um, entries on medieval travelers. And again, you know, activities with discussion and, and how to get them gather inferences from them. And then tea goes global, traces um, the history of tea from you know, the emperor who just happened to have a leaf fall in his hot water all the way through to the American tea bag. So um, just maybe one or two more screens. Uh, this one is really important because um, it, it refers to the bibliography, but it also um, kind of lays out, and I'm not going to go through this at any length, uh, it lays out the um, the research base for the Indian Ocean in world history. Um, the 500 entries were drawn from an absolutely astounding uh, collection of, of of websites and museums and books and and so on. And I'm particularly fond of the um, the retired naval individual who introduced me to the program G Projector, which you can actually find now on the National Aeronautics and Space Administration website, where you can get um, of course, free to anyone, um, the, the satellite maps that have been made on their absolutely gorgeous projections. And you can turn those into any, project, any map projection using this program called G, G Projector. So I just wanted to throw that in there. But those are the things that are there. And I think there is one more slide with a bit of information. Nope, now it's time for your questions. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Oh, thank you, Susan. Um, I want to uh, encourage people to both um, raise their hand virtually, and I think somebody just did, I heard a click, or to mm -hmm. um, you know, write questions in the uh, chat box. One question that was in the chat box, there seem to be two types of questions in the chat box. One type is you know, more historical questions, and then there are a lot, a lot, quite a few questions about um, different ways to manipulate the website, and maybe some of those we can try to answer afterwards and when we send a follow-up email, just try to answer some of the specifics about, about manipulating the website. But one question that we did get from Carolyn was, was um, why 1000 BCE was chosen or select or what, the, what are the marking, what marks it as a, a time 
uh, for a new era. Is that helpful? Well, um, it it is it is somewhat arbitrary, but um, one you can get a lot of clues from actually looking at the um, at the historical overviews. But one of the um, one of the markers was that this was the point at which they were quite sure that that I mean the consensus of scholars that we consulted um, was that people were able to um, make use of the of the um, the monsoon winds. It may have been before that or slightly after that, but but surely and probably before, but surely by this time the consensus is that they were both using the monsoon winds to travel across the Indian Ocean um, between you know the various ports um, and also that they were able to travel, use navigation systems to travel in open water as opposed to hugging the shoreline. Another question that came up that is actually um, somewhat related to the website was the question of whether the website has any way of facilitating uh, cooperation between different classrooms or different schools. Um, trust me, it was complicated enough. <laughs> <laughs> As it was, I mean, you know, even the web company that took it on, you know, soon found out that it had bitten off a, a major bite too. So um, there isn't a platform for that kind of collaboration, but I don't think that there's a reason why you couldn't connect classrooms using another instrument and simply screen share using the website. Although one reason we're using um, screenshots in this presentation today and not on the website live is because we wanted to make sure that it actually functioned. So, um, so I don't know what platforms for classroom collaboration might might actually permit enough bandwidth to be able to use the website as well. Another question we had that came in um, was about what type of um, higher um, level thinking questions one might ask when, when one is looking at the different explorers and their different tra travelers and I think that's pretty much what it was. Do you have thoughts on that other than um, well, I do, and before getting to the higher level thinking, um, I think one of the most important things to do in looking at travelers, and again, you can go back to the World History Sources uh, website, the Center for History and New Media, George Mason, chnm.gmu.edu. Um, you'll find a, a real wealth of, of questions. There's a whole entire section on travel accounts by um, the uh, dear departed uh, Jerry Bentley, in fact. And um, the very first thing that needs to be done, though, is to look at the travelers and see who they were, where they came from, how old they were, what were the purposes for which they went out. For later travelers, you also have the issue of gender. Most of the early ones that we know of were, um, were, were, were men. Um, so once you've sort of figured out the bio of these travelers, um, then I think one of the most important things that comes out um, in, for example, the medieval era is um, the purposes for which they were traveling as, for example, um, a Buddhist traveler collecting um, manuscripts who carried them back to China. Um, Ibn Battuta is found in several entries um, in the Maldives discovering, you know, the source of cowrie shells that were used as currency in West Africa and in China for trade. Um, you you think about the number or the, the the variety of religious experiences that are represented by these travelers, um, the distances that they went, and I think a, a higher order question in a way that that often confounds the old old textbooks and some of the stuff lingers in even the so-called new ones, is the idea that you know people didn't travel before you know the, like after the Romans or you know by the Romans sort of ended it and then there was you know this long nobody's traveling and then the Europeans set out and it is unfortunately true that so many textbooks talk about globalization but they only really show an interactive map of routes and when the Europeans set out uh, set out to navigate the oceans and so the the meaning of these of these travelers um, would be to to sort of analyze what are the different purposes for which they traveled. Um, do these brief entries, which of course you can expand because these travelers are quite well known and you'll find, for example, Marco Polo and you'll find even Batuta in, in many sources. Um, 
to sort of look at, well, you know, what facilitated their, their these enormously broad travels? Could they do that today with passport restrictions being what they are? Um, could they have landed in a place where their religion wasn't practiced by anyone else, or, um, or what would have what would have um, caused the selection of of ports of a traveler like Ibn Battuta? And so, in the in the case of so Marco Polo, okay, he he did cross, but it wasn't a lonely Italian ship that crossed. You know, he was making use of of travel um, of travel routes and and infrastructure of port cities and so on and so forth that had already been laid down by others. So I think that that um, that that is a, an important set of of um, of sort of higher order thinking to to really look into what does this mean. Uh, thanks. There was another kind of um, oops, uh, relatively small question, there, which you may or may not know, which is, do you, you mentioned the um, exhibit, I guess it was, it was at the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art that had rock mm -hmm. paintings. Do you by any chance know what the name of the exhibit was so somebody could find it? It's or? not an exhibit. It's something in their permanent collection, and they're called, the Mimi, okay. they're called the Mimi paintings, okay. M-I-M-I. And they are also in amazing array on um, a wonderful, wonderful website of rock art, um, which is part of how I stumbled on this, by the way, called the Bradshaw Foundation. Ah. So if you look up the Bradshaw Foundation, they were among uh, the discoverers of, of these paintings. And uh, they have a magnificent website. I can't look it up right now because I'm I'm here on the webinar, but um, but I they they go all across the entire world um, showing magnificent um, um, pictures of of rock art of different kinds and so on. Are there and they more? also have oh. yeah they they also have a marvelous map that correlates. Um, I'm trying to think now what it's called. But it's on human migration, and if you if you if you talk about human migration and and Bradshaw in a in a search, um, you will find this interactive website that shows interactive map rather that correlates climate data, rock art, and other archaeological finds, and the DNA evidence of human migration. It's absolutely spectacular, and you can actually show the students better than the maps from the from the Genographic Project, which are very, very complex. You can actually introduce this topic to your students in a, in a much more compact and quick kind of way. OK, Seth had a question, Susan, about yeah. um, if you could talk a little bit about how the rise of Muslim traders altered the existing trade routes, like the impact on Oxum, or otherwise had an impact um, on changing the trade. Um, I think there's two different questions. One is what did, how did it change the oh, okay. routes was the first part of the question, I believe. Yeah. And my answer to that would be, in a, in a, in a big sense, it didn't alter the routes. Um, the roots were were laid down in pre-Islamic times. Um, there is considerable evidence that there were already links between um, between the Yemenis and East Africa, the Persians and East Africa, um, and 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 in fact, in an earlier era, one of the entries is about um, is about the mangrove swamps, uh, which are found along several of the you know the um, you call um, coastlines of, of India. And so East Africa was kind of the lumber yard for the Arabian Peninsula for a very long period of time. So these, these routes predate Islam. And um, the people who traveled there, some of whom later you know, accepted Islam, um, provide a real way of seeing continuity. So the trade would have intensified, and the fact that um, that many of these port cities became exposed to Islam and even became the Swahili coast became um, a prominent area where Muslims lived, um, they were still making use of, of the earlier trade. It's the same thing with, uh, in fact, I, I wanted to mention one thing that is, is a, there's a, a, a small verse of the Quran that mentions the tribe uh, into which Muhammad was born, the tribe that was prominent at Mecca. There's a verse that refers directly to the tribe, the Quraysh, and their journeys in summer and winter. 
and there, one of these journeys was to Yemen, and the other one was carrying the goods that were received at Yemen to Syria. This was their lifeblood. This was, you know, running up and down the uh, the, the mountain chain, the desert area uh, routes be, uh, between the southern uh, Arabia and and the Mediterranean, and so. That trade refers directly to the time when the goods would have arrived on the Indian Ocean in Yemen on the monsoon winds. So that that their journeys were actually timed uh, to come and receive goods at that place. So uh, there were also connections that were that somewhat predated Islam, but also continued even into modern times between Yemen and Indonesia, and then Yemen and India. So another good source of, of, of information about that is um, Amitav Ghosh's book, uh, In an Antique Land, it's, which is a wonderful book anyway. Okay. Well, maybe if we can try to include that on the list of things we send out afterwards. Yeah, Are there any yeah. more questions there? Anyone want to raise their hand or type another question or show? Um, if you wanted to follow up on that question, um, that's fine too. I, can, I think Craig was, it was Seth. Seth, yeah. yeah. Um, and he can, um, I mean, at the very end, I think we're going to, I mean, after we conclude, we'll be sure that people all have your email if you're willing to. <laughs> oh, sure. To I have respond. nothing to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, this we'll is a topic, to obviously, answer. that I, I love a great deal, and I'm happy to to help. Well, I think it's really um you know, it's it's such a wonderful resource, and that you know, I'm sure that you know, after you put all this effort into developing it, you want to see people using it. So, I'm sure. Uh, you, well, and I have to give a big shout out to the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center because a yes. lot of times when something gets funded, it's sort of tossed out there, and then it has to live, you know, sink or swim on its own, so to speak. Talking about the ocean, and what Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center has done is continue to invest in this and really, you know, put in the time and effort. And believe me, it was a lot to actually bring this into the new you know, uh, next generation of the internet so that it does have uh, have a long life. And I, I can't handle them enough for that as a, as a person who helped develop this. It's, it's easy to, you know, find examples of sites that have just kind of, you know, gone somewhere to die on the internet because they no longer kept up with the technology. Okay, so thanks to them and thanks to you again. And... Um, I hope that, um, you know, and also thanks to everybody who participated. I can see quite a bit of, uh, of discussion and helping each other in the chat box. Uh oh, somebody said there. I don't know whose comment got scrubbed. Oh, but anyway, wherever it was, I missed it. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I, I can't uh, see any of the chats on, on my. Uh, oh dear, I don't know what that is. Anyway, um, I, uh, please send, if you have more questions or comments, please let us know. And also, um, again, thanks to uh, Susan. Thanks to everybody for participating. I hope you will all try to keep in touch with Primary Source through our, um, you know, our website or other media. I want to encourage people who are interested to join us in a webinar on the nature of Japanese art on December 6th. And also, we're having a global discussion with the author, Jean Luen Yang, on his books, Boxers and Saints, on January 10th. So please join us for that. And let me go on to the last slide, which I think has both Susan and my um, email addresses, so that if you do want to contact us directly, please do that. So thank you, and good night. Thank you, Peter, also. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs>